Good evening. Good evening. My name is Paula Reach. I'm uh, Mayor of Kingborough, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's council meeting on Monday, the 1st of May, 2023. A warm welcome to those members who are in the public gallery this evening, and also to those people who are watching along at home via YouTube. It's 5.30 p.m. and so I now officially declare the meeting open. I wish to advise that council meetings are recorded and made publicly available on our website and in accordance with council's policy, I'll ask the general manager to confirm that the recording has started. Confirm, Mayor. Thank you. I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, pay respects to elders past and present and acknowledge today's Tasmanian Aboriginal community. Our attendees this evening, we have myself, Councillor Reid, Deputy Mayor, Councillor Gladewright, Councillor Antoli, Councillor Bain, Councillor Cordover, Councillor Dean, Councillor Midgley, Councillor Richardson and Councillor Street. From our staff this evening, we have the General Manager, Mr Arnold, the Chief Financial Officer, Mr Breen, the Director of Engineering Services, Mr Reeve, the Director of Governance, Recreation and Property Services, Mr Smee, the Acting Manager of Finance, Ms Eaton, the Program Manager, Transform Kingston, Mr Kamitz Oglu, the Media and Communications Advisor, Ms Adams, and our Executive Assistant, Mrs Morton. We have apologies this evening from Councillor Fox. I'm looking for a mover and a seconder that the minutes of the open session of Council Meeting Number 7, held on the 17th of April 2023, be confirmed as a true record. I've got a mover in Councillor Gladewright and a seconder in Councillor Bain. All those in favour? Against? Motion is carried unanimously. Turning now to page two, workshops held since the last council meeting. We had a workshop um, on the 24th of April last Monday evening uh, in relation to the Kalis group and also a, uh, the second part of the workshop was in relation to climate change. Turning now to declarations of interest. Does any councillor have an interest they would like to declare? Councillor Midgley. Thank you, and um, interest in the closed session, I'll be leaving the meeting. Thank you very much. Any further interests? That, no, thank you very much. Transfer of agenda items. Is there any item on the agenda that a councillor would like to transfer from open into closed session or closed into open session? No, thank you. We are still on page two and we now have questions without notice from the public. Does any member of the public who's with us today wish to ask a question? Please come to the lectern. And if you just state your name and suburb before you ask your question, please. Oh, just turn it on at the side first, beg your pardon. Thank you, uh, Professor Michael Rowan from Birches Bay. Um, I refer to the bushfire risk report, which was an appendix to the agenda of April 17, but is not mentioned in the minutes. And I ask, did Council consider this report? General Manager. Through you, Mayor. Uh, Council, uh, sorry, Professor Rowan, the items that are included in the appendix are there for um, Council ran public information so that they're placed on the public record. Uh, it enables any councillor to ask questions about that particular uh, matter should they wish to do so. In that case, I'll ask, does any councillor propose to, to suggest any actions which might follow the addition of that report to the agenda on the 17th of April? Um, it's a bit of a tricky question because we, I, um, generally we don't uh, have every councillor answering a question that is put. Um, I guess my only suggestion is that uh, for that, if anybody does would like to put on their lights to make a comment, you are uh, free to do so. I'll take it in order. Councillor Dean. Um, only to point out, as was on the public record, that we held a workshop on this matter and we gave it due consideration. There was um, lengthy discussion during that hour-long workshop. Thank you. Any further comment from councillors? No. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, didn't want to jump the gun. Yeah. Professor Owen, another question? Um, I, I, I just, perhaps in introducing the question, I find it confusing uh, that, I, that the papers on the agenda of a body as important as council, and yet no mention of them is made in the subsequent minutes. 
It's certainly my experience in similar organisations that every agenda paper has an appropriate recommendation attached to it, and whether the recommendation is debated or not. Well, if it's not debated, it's considered accepted as an unstart item on the agenda. And again, I'd really encourage you, Mayor, as Chair of the Council, to adopt that good meeting practice. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions on notice? Uh, for the record, I will uh, give you my name. My name is David Grace. Um, from Snug? From, yes, Snug. <laughs> um, Mayor, with your indulgent councils, um, may I have the opportunity to, to just uh, mention uh, three of our well um, hard working citizens that passed away in the last month? Mr. Harold Anson from Bruni Island. Mr. Desi Wayman, as most know, has put a lot into the Don de Casco Channel Museum, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, regarding fishing, etc. And of course, Mr. William Cripps. Most of you would not know William Cripps because uh, he moved out of the municipality quite a few years ago and went down to Port Arthur to live and he was very heavily involved in establishing the Rural Fire Brigade uh, at uh, Woodbridge some time. I, I, I just ask for your indulgence. Thank to, you. To note that. Thank you, uh, Mayor. My question is I'm concerned about answers that we get from staff. Um, regarding our questions that we put before the table. I would like, Mayor, um, that you and your councillors uh, particularly take note sometimes of these questions that come before the table from ratepayers because um, they're important to the ratepayers. And I'll go on and, and I can point out very quickly to you, uh, Mayor, on the 3rd of April, um, Council dealt with a, a uh, tender, it says, tender, AB2212, Kingston Wetlands. I raised a question regarding that and I was told um, by staff response there was no tender uh, uh, let. Um, in the uh, agenda and also the minutes of that particular 6th of um, February council meeting, um, it says in, in the uh, agenda and in the uh, minutes, it says uh, that um, the tender had been noted. Now, I, as an individual, I took it that because it was mentioned in the minutes, uh, in the agenda, and then in the minutes too, but then the final thing when you came out of closed session and back to normal open session, if you can follow, Mayor, mm -hmm. it stated that that only be noted. So in my question to staff, would it not be appropriate um, if, if, if um, there was no tender awarded, um, why was it just no what was noted? Was there a tender or wasn't there a tender? If it, it leaves it in limbo. We don't know what what you're talking about, yep. if you know what I mean. Yep. Perhaps Mr Reeve might be able to assist us. No, Mr Smee. Uh, through you, Mayor, the difficulty in answering that question is it was in closed session. So, um, as you'd be aware, Mr Grace, the contents of closed session cannot be divulged, all that can be divulged is what council resolves to divulge. Now if um, my recollection of your question is correct, you asked who was the tender awarded to and what was the value of the tender? And my response was there was no tender awarded because that was the case. That's correct, thank you. Uh, but, um, but you had in, what, what I'm I guess the question I'm raising then, why was it put in the agenda as such, as a tender? Uh, it did state, which um, it stated on uh, the tender, uh, if you can bear with me just two secs, uh, no, I haven't got it, it was, it quoted some other thing. Um, uh, it quoted... Um, 
it quoted saying, it does not go here, anyway, it's quoted another number um, that um, the tender was being dealt under. Oh, regulation, pardon me, I'm sorry about that, I've got just paperwork here. Yeah. Um, regulation 15.2 um, um, hash D hash. Um, it says um, uh, contract and tenders for the supply and purchase of goods and services and their terms and conditions, approval and renewal. Renewal. That's what it says that's confusing if councillors can understand where I'm coming from or... Yep, yep. Mr Smee. So through you, Mayor, Regulation 15.2 comes from the local government meeting procedures and it deal, that particular regulation deals with matters that can be considered in closed session. So it is a, a general reference to matters that are appropriate to be dealt with in closed session. In relation to this matter, the content of the report dealt with a tender. In this case, it was a tender that had already been awarded and what was being provided to council was an update. So that was the reason listed in the agenda that that item was included within closed session and the justification for it, as we are required to do. Uh, I understand that, um, through you, Mayor, um, but a lot of the ratepayers don't understand that, if uh, I can just point that to you. They thought, like I, it was a tender, but I, I don't want to, you've answered the questions and I appreciate that, but um, because can I just go on to another one? Is it another question? Uh, well, it's regarding the same issue, Mayor. Okay, all right. So if I if get, you can phrase it in a question, I'd be very I, um, grateful. Yes, uh, because again, I wrote to count or email council on the 2nd of March, has council awarded a contract for the works at the wetlands? I get a reply back, yes. I get a, I get a, I get a reply back, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but it does go on to say the floating wetlands will be installed by, I don't know, USPEL next month. So that's uh, my question, if it could be just looked at, and would you please go back and look at the agenda and those minutes because it says in the minutes that it was going to be dealt with, it was dealt with, then it was just noted. But Mr Smear has answered. Yeah, so, so well, uh, what, we Mr. C, what, what Mr Smear has tried to explain is that um, we have to use the terminology from the, the meeting procedures regulations, which is why that section is quoted, um, that items to be dealt with is just a, an expression of this is what we will be dealing with, um, and those items can either be noted or approved or, you know, we've got, as yeah. you'd be aware, yeah. from when we've done it before. So I'm not quite sure what you're suggesting is incorrect. Um, well, I'm not saying it... Well, it's misleading, in my opinion, um, because I, I read it and, say, a ratepayer reads it, and it says quite clearly in your agenda for that particular council meeting on the 6th of February that council was going to deal with AB2223 uh, two, 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 mm. wetlands, mm. Uh, tender, purchase, whatever. Well, if it was going to be done in closed session, full stop, um, maybe council should have just said we will be dealing with um, the wetlands um, contract a, B, two, two, three, full stop, in closed session. I don't know. Okay. Thank you. Is that right. clarify in some... I'm not quite... I will admit I'm not quite following you, but I'm hoping Mr Smee is, so he might want to add something, because I'm well a little more confused now. I apologise. Well, if you go back... Mayor, without me instructing you, uh, um, um, if you go back and have I'll a look... I'll take it as a suggestion. And, ..and then you come back to me, uh, I'll, be, I'll be more than happy. Um, Mr Smee, did you want to add anything? Uh, yes, through you, Mayor. I, I think the confusion is that there's been an assumption made that because we listed in the agenda 
uh, a reference to a tender, then that was correct because the report in closed session included an update in relation to that particular tender. So there's been an assumption made that we were awarding a tender whereas in fact we were, Council was receiving an update in relation to a tender that had already been awarded. Yes, well that's fine, but couldn't you have put the total of that contract that was awarded, I guess, too? But it wasn't awarded at that meeting. It had been previously awarded. So that, I, I, yeah, I probably figure the one yeah. in the wetlands with the uh, one that was taken out of the road contract, I suppose. I don't know. Anyway, okay. my other question is... Um, I raised questions regarding Tears Road Snug and thanks to Councillor Cordover. Um, again, I, I asked a question, whether I didn't put the question uh, correctly, but I mean, I, I would hope that our council staff, when we do do these questions, if we don't get it perfectly right, you pick up the phone and give us a ring or, 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 you, or, you, or you're compelled to just answer the question as we writ it. I don't know, wrote it. Um, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Reeves um, stated um, at that meeting, and it's recorded, um, that further um, consultation would need to be done with the people in Tears Road. And he, he undertook to have further consultation with the people on the lower side of the road. And that's how I understood it. And I, I was wondering, and the question that I raised again was, have those discussions taken place and are the people satisfied? Mr Reeve, could you provide us with some assistance, please? Uh, through you, Mayor, yes, my understanding is they've spoken to all, all or uh, most of the affected owners on that bottom side, um, explained the situation to them. Uh, I can't make a comment as to how satisfied any particular person may be, but we've certainly put across the reasons why we would be doing things in those locations there. And in particular, um, in answer to your question there on the bottom side of the road, um, certainly the viewpoint of having a curb and channel on the bottom side of the road, it was considered that wouldn't be necessary for the amount of stormwater that was going to be generated in that area. Yes, thank you for that. I did follow that, uh, Mr Reeve, that uh, it wasn't um, economical to put the curb and gutter on the bottom side, even though I disagree with you, but that's uh, a decision that's in your hands. Um, so uh, the other question is relating to Tears Road is, um, has engineering spoke to uh, the owner of number 48 Tears Road to get, um, I was up there uh, and looked at uh, the job here only a few days ago, doing a fantastic job. It's coming along well. Um, it's going to be a shame if um, uh, two months, three months down the track, four months, whenever this um, urban uh, design, uh, urban growth gets amended, um, we're going to come along and dig the road up again. I mean, it's, it's just crazy. The water's on the uh, bottom side of that subdivision that's proposed. I mean, surely we'd put in... My question is... Why can't council put conduits in now um, so that that road's not dug up again in the, in, in, in the, in, in the near future? Mr Reeve. Through you, Mayor. Look, it is a very difficult situation where there may be potential developments in any particular area there and, and some judgments need to be made in terms of how we might actually construct or when we might actually construct anything in a particular area. Um, so we do try and take that into account, especially if we know there's, um, I guess, a, a, an approved development um, which has a, um, a, a set window associated with it, or even when it comes down to individual properties there, um, we certainly deal with the individual property owners to talk about some of the needs that they might have because they might be developing their individual property and they might want to drive away to a different location. So those type of things we do try and take into account but it is very difficult for the larger type developments because sometimes they could be many, many years before they actually come to fruition, even if they actually have a development application in place. Um, so yes, as much as possible, we try and take that into account, um, but it's impossible to actually try and um, add extra dollars into a particular project on the off chance that something may happen in the very near future. Thank you, Mayor. And just, I'm, I'm, look, I'm, I'm 
uh, on that, then the uh, application, uh, the um, developer would be quite happy to pay for those himself right now. Um, but the, the developer is very, very sick at the moment, and I can't um, contact him at the moment. He's had a major operation. Um, we, there is a full plan that um, has been certified now since 1985 of that subdivision and, and an updated here only a few, maybe a year or so ago. So it's, it, it's uh, only now waiting on the urban yep. growth is, boundary. Is there not. another question in this? No, I think I can go back home now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank thank you. you for the time. Thank I've, you for your attendance. I think you've, you look like you've enjoyed it. You look very comfortable. Yeah, I'm, I'm a bit dry in the mouth, though. I don't know why. Yeah, sorry, we can't help you with that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. OK. Um, thank you very much. We're now on uh, questions on notice from the public. Um, there were five questions on notice. The first in relation to industrial land supply in Kingborough from Mr Biggins with an officer's response from Ms Quinn. Second one in relation to bushfire risk report from Professor Rowan and an officer response from Ms Quinn. The third one in relation to dog waste bags on Bruny Island from Ms Price and an officer's response from Mr Reeve. The next one in relation to Alona Hall maintenance from Ms Price and an officer response from Mr Reeve. And the last one in relation to Ritchie Street, Alona from Ms Price, with an officer response from Mr Reeve. Um, and if anybody does wish to um, submit a question on notice, you can do so by completing the relevant form on Council's website or by emailing kc at kingborough.tas.gov.au. So we move now to page five, questions without notice from councillors. Does any councillor wish to ask a question without notice? Councillor Richardson. Thank you, Mayor. A um, couple of questions for... Um, the Director of Engineering Services. Um, on Margate Esplanade, there's a series of solar-powered battery-operated lights, um, and one of which has been out for quite some time. Um, I'm aware that, um, that a ratepayer has made contact a number of times to report the issue, and I just want to get an update on where that's at, please. Mr Reeve. Uh, through you, Mayor. Um, yes, yeah, so one of the problems we've got down there is supply issues. Um, so we have been talking with the supplier. We've also talked with a few other potential suppliers of the battery component. Um, it's one of the issues we're actually having in a number of different um, locations just uh, with some of the suppliers. Um, we are pushing that one still. Um, and the intention with those particular lights down there, I, I believe there's either one or two lights that may, may be out in that location there, will be um, to actually look at replacing all the batteries in all the lights through there because otherwise we'll find out we're in the same situation again. So yes, we are aware of it. Yes, we're aware of the fact that it's taken a little bit longer than we would like. And yes, we are pushing towards trying to get a solution for it. Councillor Richardson. Thank you. A, uh, another question for the Director of Engineering Services. Um, Craigers Road in Gordon, I've been contacted again by a rate payer, rate payer and that's a, um, a rural road that's quite narrow, uh, in quite a state of disrepair, um, and hasn't been maintained for quite some time. Um, the rate payer has been in contact with council and also I feel the uh, a contractor um, and has been given some information about um, machinery not being able to access that particular part of the road. Uh, so the question is, are we aware of any work that has or hasn't been done on that road and any plans to do work? And I guess, moreover, has there been work knocked back from that road because of machinery issues? Mr Reeve. Uh, through you, Mayor, look, I'm not aware of any particular um, reason why we wouldn't be maintaining it like any of our other unsealed roads. So we've got a lot of unsealed roads that are reasonably narrow, as that one is. Um, I believe there was a, a local slippage in that area there a little while ago, um, which sometimes can preclude some of the heavier machinery actually using the road there, but there's no particular reason why that won't be maintained similar to other unsealed roads of similar ilk. Um, it won't be maintained to the degree you might have a heavier used unsealed road, but it would still get maintained. Happy to actually take that on board there and um, forward that off to our depot to investigate. Fantastic, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, next, I had Councillor Cordover and then Councillor Antoli. Councillor Cordover. Thank you, Mayor. This question relates to the Kingston Park basketball court, the half court. As winter fast approaches, it's getting dark earlier and uh, soon it'll be 4.30 and it'll be dark, which is not long after school finishes. Currently, there's no lighting at that basketball court. Please may I have an explanation as to why there are no lights on the court at dusk, say until 8pm. And I'll preface the question by saying that there is ample lighting on the on the footpaths, there's ample lighting, night lighting around that area. I understand that noise, you, you wouldn't want noise pollution at one in the morning, but certainly between the hours of 4.30pm and say 8, I don't see why that would be a problem. And the second point is, if it were, was a security issue that we don't have night lighting at that basketball court, there's a very conspicuous CCTV camera tower pointing directly at the basketball court. So I'm confused about whether it's a safety thing or whether it's a noise pollution thing, or is it possible that we just switch on a timed light for the basketball court, please? Mr Smee, are you able to assist us with that? Uh, through you, Mayor, I'm not aware of the reasons why lighting for that wasn't included, um, but be that as it may, there, there isn't a light on the basketball court. So to include that uh, obviously comes at a cost. Um, you know, that project is now complete, so we would need to um, look at how it could be funded. Unless there is a light that can be switched on, is, if, is that the case? No. So it would need additional infrastructure. Thank you. And so is there any... So would that require a motion from, from the Council to, to um, request that infrastructure be implemented or considered for an upcoming budget? <coughs> Yes, but yep. I suspect you've probably missed the boat for the current for this budget. One. Yeah, I think so in. too. Yeah. Um, the second minor point on the basketball ring is that, um, for whatever reason, the net is now um, is, uh, woven in such a way that it's too tight so that the basketballs get caught in that net, which means that um, people of short stature or those who can't jump for whatever reason, um, the ball is constantly getting stuck in that net. And uh, unfortunately, I noticed... Um, there was a ball stuck in there on the weekend. Right. And so, well, I actually witnessed, I actually witnessed um, uh, a young man, probably eight or ten, and his father, and because the father had an injury and, it was, and so couldn't jump to rescue the ball, and so it was lucky that I'm there, and for councillors who aren't aware, I'm actually six foot five, more than two metres tall, and so I was able to rescue that ball, <laughs> but was, were I not there, um, who would, the ball would have been stuck there, which is pretty annoying, and so it was really kind of disappointing to see that that father and his son just left after getting the ball in twice because what's the point if the ball gets stuck in there every single time yeah. what's the point so anyway yeah. thanks, i sir. was there recently as part of a challenge i'm doing and we had the same problem we had to get a big stick because there was only me and one other person of the same height as me so mr smee could we have a get that looked at because i imagine it's catching a lot of the balls because if you use a regular size basketball it gets caught but we then switched to a netball and it went through so could we have that looked at please Thank you. Uh, Councillor Antoli. Thank you, Mayor. Um, since we're telling porkies, I'm 25 and, uh, and 88 kilos. Um, <laughs> and have hair. Um, I have two questions. Um, so I would like an update from a, um, a confirmation from an officer that apparently the signage promise for the Beretta Reserve to um, warn against tuning, there's been a delay and I believe it should be installed when received from the manufacturer over the next week or two. Could someone just confirm that for the record and the yes. three or four families watching tonight? Yep, General Manager. Uh, through you, Mayor, Councillor Antoli, we are waiting for the manufacturers to provide the signage. Yep. Uh, we're anticipating it'll be this week or next and we will install them as soon as we get them. Thank you, General Manager. My next question um, is ostensibly about the works on um, Channel Highway outside, uh, outside Council, and I've been told because, unfortunately, it's uh, coming up in closed session when I lodge the question. I'm not able to ask the question, uh, but for the sake of the community that is desperate to have an update, can some statement be made to update them on what is happening? out there in terms of timing because people are really quite desperate and several have yep. asked can you bring it up at council 
Yeah, so look, as you're aware, um, as you've just stated, there is a matter we're considering in closed session this evening, so it would be inappropriate for us to make a comment until such time as we've um, dealt with that matter at, and then once that's been dealt with, we'll be in a position to be able to make a statement and update right. members of the community. I fully respect that everyone's very keen to know the progress, but we do need to consider that report first and that's consistent with um, the way that we deal with any questions on notice that relate to, without notice, I beg your pardon, that relate to anything on the agenda. Great. Thank you for explaining that to the community, Mayor, and that's all from me. Thank you, Councillor Antoli. Councillor Midgley. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of questions. Um, the first one, just in relation to what Professor Rowan asked in regards to the appendix item, Kingborough Road Bushfire Assessment Project. I guess I was surprised it was in the appendix, but what is the decision making in regards to that such an item being in the ap appendix? And I know that we did have an extensive um, workshop on that. General Manager. Uh, through you, Mayor, it's a good question, Councillor Midgley. Uh, my recollection is that um, the author of that uh, particular item in the appendix um, was not of the uh, mind that it required a resolution of council, uh, but wanted to get it on the public record. Great, thank you very much. Uh, the next few questions relate to the questions that the Bruny Island Community Association submitted via Tammy Price. Uh, the first one in regards to the dog poo bags, I think that's been raised quite a few times and I've asked that question and I note that um, Mr Reeve has said that they're waiting on sort of standalone um, dog waste bags but the Bruny Island, I guess, community association would love to see and many residents would love to see the um, similar bins that we have around the municipality now just for the um, dog poo waste bags to be located next to the bins. Um, and that they have volunteers ready to go to collect the bags, put them around um, Bruny Island, and that they'll actually do the work um, in regards to, like, you know, maintaining them and things like that. So I guess why are we looking at a new solution when we've sort of been... They've been waiting quite a while. There's a lot of dog waste, evidently, in these areas as well. Mr Reeve. Uh, three there. I guess the reason why we've been waiting is a little bit tied up with the fact that um, KWS is about to take on the collection on Bruny Island. Um, I keep talking about this in terms of the new trucks there that I keep promising that don't yet arrive, but um, <laughs> the intention behind it is they take on that service there um, and we don't have the issues of having a, um, a if you like, a contract there's that, that's on the good grace and will that they're actually continuing to provide that service for, for council um, and, you know, then having to negotiate additional costs associated with actually picking up other things as well at the same time. The other point I would probably make too is that I, I understand that the community are keen and they're also keen to actually be involved in terms of, you know, some of the um, putting the bags in place and so forth. We have tried this sort of stuff before and I think if we were going to run a service out there, my suggestion would be that it was actually council that actually organised the bags and uh, as we do on the mainland there and made sure that we replenish them because otherwise it does come down to individual community members there and it may start off quite well and then for whatever reason um, that falls off and people come along there and they can't access bags and that sort of stuff. It's a more solid service if it's actually done by, done by council and, and there's not a huge cost in terms of actually replenishing the bags um, as such. Um, in terms of the, the bins and um, the type of bins, as I've sort of mentioned before, we are looking at trying to put standalone bins um, throughout the municipality. Um, so we're trialling a couple at the moment there, which is similar to what Clarence actually uses. Um, there is probably not a huge reason why we couldn't actually have a similar setup on Bruny Island where the public place bins are as to what we have at the moment as at least a temporary type solution there. In other words, the bags are incorporated as part of the actual bin itself. So there is a possibility of doing that. I think what we've sort of been hesitant on though is to say, look, we know the trucks are very close um, and we know we're about to take on that service there. Um, so we, we've sort of said, well, maybe we should have a little bit of patience, bearing in mind that, you know, we've never provided that service on Bruni up until this point, um, so it's a new service, um, so that will probably be a neater way of doing it. 
that's a long convoluted answer, but I thought I'd, I'd do that because it keeps coming up as questions there and I thought I'd, I, I should make it very clear in terms of what the reasoning is behind it all. Great, thank you very much and I'm sure the Community Association will appre appreciate the long answer and also I guess um, that advice around the volunteer type thing as well because I don't think that's been um, very clear in the past, sorry if it's okay to say that, um, just because that question will keep arising um, on that matter. So I'll have, we'll have that in the minutes I'm sure. Um, and just in regards to the other question they've asked around Ritchie Street, Alonna, noting um, Mayor Mr Reeves' response in regards to the 50 kilometres, they've requested 40 kilometres. Um, again, there's just been um, yeah, conversation around that difference that that 10 kilometres made in regards to dust and noise and safety and things like that. So I guess I'm just asking around that advocacy that there is, is there just, that's it, there's no way that it can be moved to 40, it's 50 and that's just, that's that. Well, as, as Mr Reeves said in his answer, it's not up to council, it's up to the Commissioner for Transport to make a decision and generally when we ask for decisions on changing uh, speed limits that are not consistent with um, the Australian standards and Ausroad guidelines, um, then they get rejected by the Transport Commissioner. Um, we've seen that numerous times with the requests that we've put in, so I think Mr Reeve was trying not to... <laughs> Go down that. Um, to raise expectations in relation to that. Okay, thank you. Uh, further questions without notice from councillors? Okay, we'll keep moving through the agenda. Um, petitions still being actioned, there were no petitions still being actioned, and at the time the agenda was compiled, there were no petitions that had been received. We turn now to page six, officers reports to council, donations policy 3.3, recommendation on page eight. I'm looking for a mover and a seconder, please. Got a mover in Councillor Midgley and a seconder in Councillor Gladewright. Councillor Midgley. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is a great um, policy and a great scheme that we offer at council, the policy donations and the mayoral donations. Um, just noting that in the discussion points, as those who have read the agenda and for the community, there's a bit of a um, change regarding the layout of the policy. Um, there's an increase in the amount paid for interstate representation, um, which is great because personally I had an experience of paying nearly $3,000 for a child to go interstate um, for a soccer tournament last year, which is quite a big um, impact and oh, quite a big expense, sorry, not an impact, it's what you have children for, isn't it? And, um, <laughs> and you... Well, children are a big impact. <laughs> and this is, you know, this, this sort of um, um, policy is a great donation towards that um, and then change to the specific, specify the mayoral donations as a one-off donations and not for regular annual donations. Um, and there's some other guidelines and things like that. And there's a marked up copy there. I think for me, it looks good. Just had a couple of questions just around the mayor donations as a one-off donation. So say for example, if a school one year asked for a sand pit one-off donation and then the next year the school asked for say an event donation, even though they're separate um, you know, ideas, but they're some from the same uh, organisation, how would that be? My interpretation of it is that that would be acceptable, but what I've noticed um, in the time I've been Mayor that there has, seems to have been a past practice where um, a range of organisations that operate in Kingborough um, write annually and ask for a mayoral donation towards, um, say, their fundraising or a particular event. And so they're asking for $500 every year towards something. And that, to me, sort of isn't uh, in the spirit of what this program should be about. It should be for different things. Um, so if it was one of those organisations coming back the following year for something different that they're organising, then I think that that would be acceptable. But um, it was, it's just to prevent it being used as a regular income stream for a you know, a set event or, or something that an organisation is putting on. Great, that makes sense. Um, sorry, the other one, it was again around the um, donations for um, interstate, international travel type thing. I note, I'm quite sure we got an email from Minister Street's office regarding their application process um, for people to apply for donations and things like that, because sometimes often when you um, 
you know, have a sporting adventure over interstate or overseas that you often write to all the different politicians mm -hmm. and ask money, but I'm sure they sent us an email noting that they've streamlined that process and there was a mm -hmm. sort of a link to that. So it would be great somehow, if possible, if they do then ask for um, donations for different sporting pursuits or clubs and things like that, that we could actually send them as well, that link. And so I'll we have a link now on our website. Um, and oh, OK. Yeah, so... Um, that we put that up last year because I was getting a flood of individual emails. So now we have a, a link on our website. Um, and so when somebody writes to ask for a donation, I refer them to the to the website. They fill out a form and then it's processed by our staff. So it's a much quicker uh, process because they can now upload the proof of participation and do it all online. Great, thank you. I yes. guess just sending them any further information in case they needed to know about other um, local donations they could apply for, say from, I think it was Minister Street's office around that yep. application and also the Tasmanian Institute of Sport as well. So I guess as a, you know, my experience as a parent doing this was that I didn't know there was all these other things that they could apply for. No. Um, so I guess it's probably not our position to do that, but it, you know, when you do it, you then find out this information, you pass it on to other families who are doing it. Yeah. And I, look, I think there's actually some, there would be some benefit in us um, writing to sporting or emailing sporting organisations based in Kingborough to let them know that um, you know these grants and are available the donations are available for interstate and overseas representation because I think there's probably we get a lot from specific sports like athletics and gymnastics we don't get as much from other sports so I would hope that they're all aware of them um, and it's probably something that we can market a little bit more on our social media because I'm constantly sort of talking to parents about it and saying, look, if you, you know, if you do have a child who's selected, then please, you know, make an application. It's not means tested. It's not, you know, it's just an automatic $150 that will be now, which is good. Yep. Yes, that's a good idea. And also it's not just for sport as well. It can be the chess it clubs is. and arts and that's um, performance and things like that. So, yeah. And recently we had somebody apply who was going for a beekeepers competition overseas. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, Councillor Antoli and then Councillor Cordova. Thank you, Mayor. So my assumption, of, uh, this is to do with Section 5. So my assumption is that the total budget line item for donations is 15,000 and it's split according to 5.1 and 5.2. Is that right? Uh, page 7, did you say? Yeah, section five of the report, 5.1 and 5.2, finance. Mm, I'm not going to try and guess, but I believe... Ms Eaton, can you help us with that, please? Uh, through you, Mayor, I believe it's two separate line items in the budget, and one is for the overall budget and then one for the Mayor's donations. So coincidentally, it coincidentally comes to 15,000, is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Yep. And this is set as in um, it's it's not changeable because it's for this current financial year? Well, it's determined each uh, annually during our budget process. Correct. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Cordova. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to echo the sentiment of what a good program this is, and I'm really pleased to see that um, the the amount of donations, the quantum, is increased by 50% in this proposal. Uh, I think the changes are good to actually make those clarifications between the notion of a once-off donation and the notion of these ongoing things, for example, um, annual school citizenship awards and those kinds of things. I wanted to make the point that, uh, and this is probably apropos of the recent Kingborough's Got Talent we, uh, event that was on, that was so brilliant um, the other night, we have such an amazing group of people in Kingborough and we should be so proud of them and they're doing, they're doing us proud by representing us uh, all over the place. And, but of course cost is a barrier for so many people and so anything that the council can do to lean in uh, and help is I think a really good thing and, and part of our core business. Uh, but I also wanted to make the point that it's a broader thing than just sports, and I was really pleased to see that that actually was articulated with um, social, economic, environmental development or community wellbeing programs. So I think that's a real benefit as well. And then the, the larger part of this becomes the communications piece to make sure that people actually understand that they can avail themselves of these opportunities, uh, rather than just by word of mouth, that we can have a more consistent and streamlined approach to make sure that people are able to um, 
are able to get these opportunities. My question is around uh, in the discussion on 4.2, so that's page 7, where it says the amount paid for interstate representation has not increased in many years, so a 50% increase is proposed. It should be noted that eligibility for these payments is not limited to sporting representation. My question is about the mechanism. Are we going to index that to CPI? Or why are we doing it on an ad hoc basis where we're just going to wait until 2028 when this is reviewed to try and think about whether we should change it? Shouldn't we build in a mechanism to increase the amount that we give um, on some kind of more methodical basis than just an ad hoc basis? Ms Eaton, would you like to comment on that? Uh, through you, Mayor, I don't know that I have an answer on that. I believe it would need to be built into the policy and if councillors wanted to approve that. Okay, thank you. So that might mean, maybe I will propose an amendment then um, to do that. And uh, before I do, I just wanted to also point out that there are, there are other avenues to get support from council, whether it's the community grants program or, or other such avenues. So I think it's important um, just to make that point that there's, there's many different ways that council can support the community. Uh, so I would like to move an amendment that the the amount of the donations policy is indexed to... I wonder if it's better rather than just coming up... Because, you know, which, do we use CPI or do we use the WPI <laughs> or do we use... Can I please... What do we do? We would have to defer it, which we may not want to do. Long-term financial plan. So to the long-term financial plan. That's a great... Point. Does anyone, <laughs> can we move I into discussion it, I, briefly? I think it might be better to defer it so that we can come up with a, um, uh, something that's workable rather than okay. making policy on the run. Yep. So if I could have somebody move that the matter be deferred and then um, the staff can do some work on it and bring something else back. So it's uh, moved by Councillor Midgley, uh, seconded by Councillor Antoli that the matter be deferred. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Motion is carried. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, we move now to page 16, Copping Refuse Site Joint Disposal Authority Rule Changes with a recommendation on page 17. Looking for a mover and a seconder, please. I've got a mover in Councillor Street, very enthusiastically, and a seconder in Councillor Midgley. <laughs> Councillor Street. I'm saying it through to the end. <laughs> uh, so this is now, and I'm looking at the general manager, the fourth time Yep, the fourth time uh, Council have considered um, the Copping Refuse Site Joint Disposal Authority rule changes. The good news is um, that all of the previous approvals have got us to this point um, where the rules have now been certified by both a legal practitioner and the general manager of the Clarence Council as nominating council. And now all that is required uh, is for us to formally adopt the certified rules, um, which I'm hoping... Uh, is a non-event given we have already approved them three times. <laughs> um, and so I'd ask my colleagues to support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Street. Any further discussion? If not, I'll put the motion um, as printed on the screen, moved by Councillor Street, seconded by Councillor Midgley. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Motion is carried unanimously. Let's hope we don't have that one back. Uh, we now move to notices. Uh. Can I move to discuss? No. no. No, he has to move it himself, otherwise it lapses. Awkward. Do you want to... <laughs> Just... <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is. Just for the information of those who are watching along at home, um, we've come to page 63. Notice of motion that's been submitted by Councillor Dean in relation to junior toilet facilities. Um, and he has just left the room for a short toilet break, it seems. So we're just going to take a two minute adjournment because the motion does lapse if he doesn't move it. So bear with us for a moment and we'll be back.
Okay, welcome back. Apologies for that short interruption. We are still now on page 63 with a notice of motion headed junior toilet facilities. There is an officer's response from Mr Smee and I'm looking for a mover, which will be Councillor Dean and a seconder, Councillor Gladewright. Councillor Dean. Right, well after that um, brief <laughs> interlude, um, what I'm proposing um, at tonight's meeting here is to consider providing uh, junior toilet facilities um, as part of our public toilet program. Um, or strategy, having toilets and wash basins um, that are designed for young children uh, rather than adults allows children the autonomy of toileting themselves. Um, it not only adds the, aids their development but improves safety and ultimately helps reduce the stress that often comes with going to a public toilet with a child. Uh, parents around Hobart are becoming quite used to these um, such facilities. Um, so as a council um, in Kingborough's case that really does pride itself on being a family friendly um, area, I'd like to see us joining those other uh, council areas and setting a really high standard for public facilities. Um, council set the standard for playgrounds when it built Kingston Park um, and so it only makes sense that the facility um, has the child friendly toilets to match. Um, and as part of this motion I've included three points which um, those who have access to the agenda will see but broadly what they're intended to do is to uh, upgrade the facilities that we already have uh, to capture any current projects that are currently underway and also um, looking a little bit more long term in terms of upgrading any uh, toilets in the future. If passed tonight, this motion clearly will involve an additional cost to us as council. Um, however, I believe these will be limited by the fact that this is very much about targeting uh, only those facilities in Kingborough with very high levels of use of small children. Um, furthermore, recently council has shifted towards a trend of installing prefabricated toilet units. Uh, these, I understand, offer a significant cost saving to council. And so, as I understand it, I believe they are a, such junior facilities I'm proposing here can be accommodated into such units. And finally, I just want to highlight the officer's response, which states that, quote, the actions contained within the motion are supported and can be incorporated into council's current and future planning for public toilet facilities end quote. Um, I'm really pleased with that positive response and so I'm keeping tonight's uh, little spiel very brief only to ask the support of other councillors here tonight for this motion. Thank you Councillor Dean. Um, Deputy Mayor Gladright. Uh, thank you Mayor. Um, thank you Councillor Dean for advocating on behalf of the small people in our municipality. Um, as a mother of uh, two small people I um, I'm always very appreciative when these um, children's toilets are available for use. They are very, very handy as a parent, but it's also really important for the child to start learning their own autonomy um, within their sort of toilet training period. So, um, and it is notab noticeable that in other amazing play spaces around southern Tasmania, these toilets are in fact there for use. So. Um, I did advocate for uh, one of these children's toilets um, when I was at a recent steering committee um, meeting for Kingston Park, um, noting that I'm only supposed to be an observer, but I did um, speak up for one of those. What they have got over there now is a, um, I'm not sure if you've seen them, but the toilet seats with the, the kids' ones that sort of fold down. Um, not quite as good, not... Um, not as handy for little people to use, but they have provided something there. But yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to support this motion. I think it's a great thing. Um, my only question was just in A, it says um, upgrading existing toilet facilities. Is If we're agreeing to this um, recommendation, does that mean that that will actually go ahead and happen or is it just for the future planning? Mr Smee. Uh, through you, Mayor, as I've indicated in my response, you know, we would need to uh, scope, design and prepare a budget submission. So um, given where we are in our budget cycle, it would be something that we would be putting in for the following financial year, um, not the one coming. Yeah, because um, I think you're right. It's um, looking at which toilets are in high use um, of little people will be most beneficial. Thank you. Uh, next I had Councillor Midgley and then Councillor Bain. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Dean, for this motion. It's really great, as um, other councillors have said, speaking um, for the voice of the children that we don't always hear from. Um, I haven't gone and checked out the toilets at the Kingston Park stage too. I've had a bit of a play on the, um, you know, the, the bike track thing, but haven't been to the bathroom there. But I um, recall that over several times I'd asked when there was Kingston Park updates if that facility would include um, amenities and um, accessibility for children. So sounds like there's some sort of something but not really so I guess I sort of think oh we'll do sh you know I kind of feel disappointed that I didn't bring a motion earlier to make sure it wasn't actually perfect in the first place because it was very much a comment um, at Kingston Park stage two in regards to those amenities and making sure that we had that so um, yeah so it's great that we can perhaps look at something um, now uh, I guess my co my question is when I um, once worked uh, for a local government and we we're looking at upgrading parenting rooms around the city I did a bit of a consultation around um, you know what parenting rooms were around different um, other local government areas and then did some consultation with local parenting groups around what was important in regards to parenting rooms I guess we can kind of make assumptions around what parents might like but I just wonder as well if perhaps we're looking to include these in the future if we might say contact a few um, local family daycares or parenting groups or something like that just to actually see what kind of style they would prefer I guess for children um, rather than kind of make assumptions that this is what we think they might like if would that be sort of possible to look at that in the future Mr Smee uh, through you me yes absolutely we don't um, profess to have a great deal of expertise in relation to this area it's a, a relatively um, new addition um, so certainly we would look to consult with um, the key stakeholders in relation to the most appropriate design. Thank you. Uh, next I had Councillor Bain and then Councillor Cordova. Thank you Mayor. Um, I can certainly agree being a parent is an excellent motion to be appreciated by toddlers and parents I imagine. Uh, just one question, if the motion does pass um, What's the next step? Are we, are we looking at amending the public toilet strategy or will it be more of a case-by-case -case basis in terms of Mr. rollouts? Uh, through you, Mayor. So there's three components to this. The first is we've got some public toilet upgrades on the go at the moment. We can um, immediately ensure that consideration is given to the provision of children's toilets as part of them. Um, the second phase is the um, retrofit of our high use areas which I've already indicated we would need to do scope, design and cost, get it into our budget and then yes the third component as uh, in the motion is an amendment to our public toilet strategy which contains a section on best practice design features. Uh, it currently doesn't reference children's toilets so um, it would be appropriate to amend that strategy to include um, that particular provision. Councillor Bain. And I gather with the motion the idea is it's uh, for the high use toilets? Yes, well uh, that's my reading of the motion. Councillor Dean, can you nod to... Yes, thank you. So that'll be determined through the, the policy that's written? Correct. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cordova. Thank you, Mayor. Briefly, just uh, I'm in support of it. I think it's a good idea and I thank the councillor for bringing it to us. Um, I wanted to, because I'm no expert in this area either, I just wanted to mention that when we do have those discussions about what's the most appropriate design and things like that, I wanted to add into the mix that um, junior ambulant toilets are defined, um, I think, in early childhood centres for children with a mobility uh, disability but who are able to walk with or without a mobility aid, whereas ambulant toilets for adults are required by the National Construction Code. Um, there's no mandatory requirement to provide ambulant toilets in children's facility facilities. Um, however, I just wanted to kind of add that into the mix that if we are going down this direction, which I think we should, um, if it can suit all people, then that would be great. So just um, I would hope that we could consider that as well. Thanks very much. Thank I support you. the motion. Thank you, Councillor Cordova. Um, before I ask Councillor Dean if you'd like to sum up, um, I just want to make a couple of comments. Thank you for bringing the motion. Um, it's interesting, as soon as I read it, I thought, oh, yeah, I remember 
being a parent of a small child like that and having to go into when your children are now 21 and 23 you tend to sort of forget those days so I think that's why it's great that we have a diversity of um, of uh, counsellors around the table now to think of um, all angles of something um, I, I just uh, I'm fully supportive of this and I was really pleased when um, the Deputy Mayor raised at the uh, Kingston, one of the Kingston Park meetings that we would have, um, that we should have uh, toilet seats that are the, so it's like a double seat, so it's got the adult toilet seat and then on the inside there's a, a smaller toilet seat so that children can sit more comfortably on it, so the toilet is still at the same height. So all of the it's my understanding now that all of the toilets, certainly in the new part of Kingston Park, um, those toilets have all got those um, seats now, because I used one last week when I was um, down there after a walk. Um, so that's great. We do, I guess the thing we would need to consider is if this is going to be, if we're going to have little children's toilets in places where there are only one or two cubicles, um, then you could end up with only one adult toilet available and one children's toilet and is that you know is that optimal or would you still want to have as the compromise the toilet set the, the double toilet seat that folds down that can then accommodate both so they're the sort of things that I think we need to consider um, when we do look at this in the context of the policy and also the location because we don't want to end up creating a further problem in high use areas where we create lines and lines and lines because there are, you know, um, there are only little people toilets available and there are a lot of adults wanting to go. So we have to get the balance right here is what I'm trying to say. But I think it's great, great initiative and we do aim to be very family friendly here. So um, I thank Councillor Dean for bringing this and ask if you'd like to sum up. Yeah, I might do. Um, first, by just saying um, thank you to all the councillors and obviously to the staff who have been supportive of... At the end of the day, we're here discussing toilets, um, and uh, but it still is a great thing that we're here making positive change. It sounds like this will get up. Um, just to touch on a couple of things that have been mentioned, I think it would definitely require some level of professional expertise from our staff in terms of deeming when it is appropriate or not, and I would think of a fairly basic test would be whether we, if we decide that the family room is appropriate, say at the new ones that you've just highlighted at stage two of Kingston Park, then in that case um, I would hope that we would almost always include an additional um, smaller toilet in that uh, case. When I went, I'm really pleased to hear also that they've been installed already because when I was there a couple of weeks ago they, they weren't and I noticed not just obviously that they were lacking but that there was sufficient room in that family room that's down or parents room that's down there. Um, so hopefully moving forward we'll at least be able to um, install them where family rooms are at least and I understand your point about um, not, you know, obviously limiting um, other toilets, of course, but yes, uh, to come down to ultimately this will be uh, something that we consider on a case-by-case -case basis. And whether we decide that in that instance um, we feel there's appetite for it to be budgeted for in the future, for it to be retrofitted, fantastic. But I think now we've got considerable um, playground and toilet upgrades already happening, Spring Farm being one, and if we can now make sure that um, we have in uh, Spring Farm, for example, which is clearly going to be a playground with high use of small toddlers and children, that it's already in there, um, then I think that's um, a really good win. So thank you, everyone, for your positive comments. Thank you. I'm going to put the motion now, as moved by Councillor Dean, seconded by Councillor Gladewright. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Motion is carried unanimously. We turn now to page 64, confirmation of items to be dealt with in closed session. Uh, that in accordance with Regulation 15 of the Local Government Meeting Procedures Regulations 2015, Council by absolute majority moved into closed session to consider the following items, confirmation of minutes, applications for leave of absence, Kingston Main Street upgrade, Kingra Waste Services Board appointment, delegated authority rates January to March 2023, and Kingra Lions United Football Club request for loan. I'm looking for a mover and a seconder, please. I've got a mover in Councillor Gladewright, seconder in Councillor Midgley. All those in favour? Against? 
motion is carried unanimously in accordance with the Kingborough Council meetings, audio recordings, guidelines, policy, recording the open session of the me meeting will now cease. Thank you very much to all those uh, people who have been watching along at home. Uh, the open session of council now adjourns.